Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to church. Go ahead and stand with us. As we begin our worship service tonight. Help. 
bound man, Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. And behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. As I mentioned earlier this morning, we are going to spend a little bit of time in prayer in just a few moments, kicking off um, what will be, Lord willing, an entire year of praying for revival for our church, for our city, for our nation and the world. But before we dive into that, I just want to spend a few moments and share with you something that if you were in my Sunday school class this morning, how many of you were in my Sunday school class this morning? A few. This will sound eerily familiar because it's basically the same thing. Uh, but it encouraged my heart so much this morning and then on the topic of praying um, for revival in our church. I think that it just goes hand in hand. So as we begin our time tonight, I just want to, I, I want us to think about a question. What is the purpose of us praying together? Why do we go to the Lord in prayer? And there's a few reasons that I want to share with you. The first is that we pray that we might glorify God. God gives us prayer to make much of himself. If you would look in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Super Bowl scores coming in. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So we see three ideas at work here. First, Jesus instructs us to pray in his name. Second, he will do or answer our prayers according to us praying in his name. We should have confidence because our prayers in the Son will be answered. And third, we pray in His name and our prayers are answered so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
and should encourage us when we go before the throne of God that in going before him boldly, he instructs us to pray in his name that he will answer for an in, I, I, expressed purpose in verse 14. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, if you look at John chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And we don't have to bear fruit so that we can gain our salvation, but it is the fruit that flows out of our life that is the hallmark that we actually, in fact, are in Christ. If God saves someone, His Spirit comes in, into them and their life is radically changed and they will, will bear fruit. If they abide in Christ, that is, if they continue to place their finished trust their faith on Christ and then look secondly in John 15 if you abide in me so if you continue to place your faith and trust in Christ and my words abide in you so there are two things going on here trusting in the Lord and then receiving the word of God into your life in, in such a way that it is abiding in you so that as you pray, as you are stirred to pray, God receives the glory. What does it mean for God to be glorified? What does it mean for God to be glorified? In Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. And I saw, starting in verse 22, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun nor moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Revelation chapter 21 talks about God's glory in the new heavens providing the light for the city in which there is no light. It is God himself who provides the radiant light needed throughout all of eternity. One of the great Bible scholar of our time, and I may have mentioned this before, I know I did this morning in Sunday school, R.C. Sproul recently passed away, absolutely excellent um, communicator of God's word and of doctrinal truth. And R.C. had this reoccurring dream after his father passed away. His dream was that he approached the gates of heaven and met his father there and he would ask his father one question at the beginning of this dream simply now that I'm in heaven where is the glory of God I want to see God's glory and his dad's response every time in this reoccurring dream was simply RC remember you're in heaven now the glory of God is everywhere I want to be wonderful, friends, to, when the time comes that we will live in the presence of the glory of God for, throughout all of eternity, that there won't be one moment without the goodness of God's radiant glory shining into our existence. Another way to put it is that the glory of God is the holiness of God going, going public. It is the character of God, all of who He is, being made known and being loved. So if we are going to be given to prayer this year, we need to remember that that prayer serves a purpose, and that purpose is not just so that we get what we want, but so that God might receive the glory. Secondly, we pray to make known in the world 
excuse me, to make God known in the world by our bearing the fruit of the gospel. In James chapter 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my name, he may give it to you. Notice the, the phrase in John 15, verse 16, so that. He says, I choose you to bear fruit so that you will get answers to prayer. So that whatever you ask in my name, he may give it to you. Prayer is an instrument for the purpose of fruit bearing. God made us to make him known in the world by bearing the fruit of the gospel, by bearing the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, and all of the other fruits of the Spirit that are listed in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23. The means that God uses are our abiding in him and our prayer this allows the world to see that it is not us who are doing the work alone but that God is at work in our lives one other note here understanding that the point of John 15 16 is bearing fruit that abides keeps us from the way uh, that the prosperity gospel twists this passage we see clearly here that whatever you ask in my name is not money it's not possessions it's not even necessarily health or happiness or all of those things what we long for as Christians because we have realized that we really are sinners in need of repentance and grace every moment is we desire to be transformed we desire to be changed moment by moment by moment and bear much fruit in our lives. And God freely gives us the grace to continue to bear much fruit. Third, we pray so that we have access to our great commander while we are in a time of war you say what many people live their entire christian lives as though the christian life is just something to enjoy we receive our salvation and then we set back and and we we pick out the kinds of things we like in christianity and the things that don't grate against our sensitivities and and we just kind of camp there we live there because we're happy there you know, and the reality is, is for everybody in this room, in our nation, in our lifetime, we haven't seen blood shed as far as a, um, a war on our, in, inside of our nation, in our country. And so with that, sometimes we kind of grow a little bit spoiled. We kind of become just, everything is about me being comfortable but when we live in wartime it's completely different we, we get stuck in our minds that war is something that happened long ago and and it, it doesn't really have anything to do with our lives but the bible and we'll get to some of these passages in just a second continually and clearly points out that we live in a raging spiritual battle every single second that we are here In fact, there's a, a book that was recently penned called Flags of Our Fathers, and it's about the Battle of Iwo Jima during World War II. In, in this book, there's a story of a young man named Jack Lucas. He entered the Marines at the age of 14, um, deceiving his recruiters because he physically appeared to be older than what he was. And when he was 17 years old, he was a stowaway on a ship that was landing there in Iwo Jima. 17 years old. He was actually, in fact, not listed as a combatant. But he was on that ship, and as, as all of his buddies bailed out of the boat and, and, and charged into battle and started to fall, he came along behind them, and he picked up their weapons, and he fought on. And he kept fighting, and he kept fighting, and he kept fighting. 
and he was sitting with some of his buddies on a, a, a bank and, and the, one of the enemy threw a grenade in his dire- direction so he took, a, he took the end of his rifle and he shoved that grenade into the dirt and it exploded saved his friend's lives then he noticed another grenade just a little while later and had no time to grab his gun and so he knew he had one choice either let his friends die or jump on the grenade so he jumped on the grenade blew him into the air his friends thought he was dead went on fighting the battle later they returned to get his dog tag so that his death could be recorded and and gather up all of his munitions and his gun but what his friends found when they came back to gather his dog tags was the fact that Jack wasn't dead he was still breathing 21 surgeries later, he would recover. He would go on to spend the rest of his life serving his country and his community. In 2001, when the author of Flags of Our Fathers was, was pinning that book, the author asked Jack a very simple question. Why in the world did you jump on top of that grenade? Why did you do that? And Jack's response was simple, clear, but it should move us in the direction of our own spiritual battle. Jack simply replied, look, I was just trying to save my friends. And in our own spiritual battle, in the reality that every one of our neighbors, every one of our friends, every one of our family members who die without Christ, every one of those people will spend eternity separated from God, eternally perishing. And so we should approach our lives being aware of the fact that we are in a battle. Again, the scripture clearly teaching this. At the end of Paul's life, he could say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. In two chapters earlier, chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 Paul exhorts Timothy to share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuit since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him it is a daily fight that we are engaged in and friends I think that we have to be aware of the, the, the reality that every Christian who comes to the point of being entangled in daily pursuits that have no eternal significance piling up a fortune, being motivated by money, relational problems, whatever those things are, they didn't get entangled overnight. It was a slow process of focusing on the wrong things, of neglecting the grace of prayer, of not being in the Word of God. And friends, tonight, if you in some area, and we all do struggle with being entangled with the things of this world where we find ourselves entangled we must remember that God is ready to set us free if we would run to him in prayer and spend time with him listening to him in his word so in this battle we have an enemy Satan as we've dis- as we've discussed so many times first Peter chapter 5 verse 8 Satan says Satan seeks to devour us he is disgusted Uh, with the thought that we would love and live inside of the Word of God continually. In Mark chapter 4, verse 15, Jesus says that Satan comes and steals the seed of the Word away from our hearts. Satan is real in his attacks against God's people, against us, against our church, against Christianity and our nation today are real. And we can't fight this battle on our own. And so what we need to, to remember is this helpful illustration John Piper actually gives about what prayer really is in our lives. He says prayer is like having a walkie-talkie during wartime where you can radio back to headquarters and get all of the supplies you need and get all of the help that you need and get all of the planning that you need moment by moment, second by second, so that you can fight the battle. 
But the sad reality is is that so many of us in church today don't treat prayer as though it were a walkie-talkie in the middle of our combat. We treat prayer as though it were the intercom to ring the maid to bring us a pillow or something that we want to drink to make our lives comfortable. We don't ask that God would radically change our neighbor, that, 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 that God would work in the lives of, of the lost people in our community. Far too often, we're concerned about things that are fleeting, that are civilian pursuits, that are temporary. So we should be encouraged to not take our responsibility to pray fervently should not take that responsibility lightly. I mean, what if in a battle scene, in a war, you had a commander over a platoon of soldiers and there was a massive battle going on and he yelled back to the guy that had the, the, the radio to call headquarters, hey, call for this reason. I, I, we, need, we need air support. And the guy picked up the intercom and said, hey, we need a bunch of sleeping bags, marshmallows. We're going to have a bonfire. We're going to kick it. It's going to be awesome. If we're not careful, friends, moment by moment in our lives, we shrink back into that position of using prayer for frivolous things or neglecting to pray at all. So we need to turn our hearts in prayer. And that's why I've committed to giving you each week one of these cards. It's not just a silly exercise. I think that we can make a real difference by going to the Lord in prayer day by day over the next year. We need to remember that we are to love other Christians well by praying for them. Remember John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. I told my Sunday school class this morning when I read that. That, for instance, since I've been here, I've had conversations with people where they basically, in no uncertain terms, say, you know, we, could, we would really be a great church if we, if we could unload all of the people that are just obnoxious. If we could get rid of the people that just weigh us down, because, man, we are really cool people. We're really awesome at evangelism. We really do a, a, a frighteningly good job at drawing people in. So the real problem isn't us, it's all of the, you know, the heavy weight in the church. Am I the only one that thinks that's absolutely ludicrous? Friends, I am grateful that God tells each one of you to love the most difficult Christians in the church. Because at times, I am the most difficult Christian in the church. And so are you. And we are called to love one another. In spite of all of our idiosyncrasies and all of our trivialities and all of those things, we are called to love one another. And as we do that more and more, God receives the glory for it, and it is enticing to the world. It's beautiful when you see a group of people who are not like each other in any respect, but the one thing they share in common is this love for Jesus, building one another up and continually loving each other. Friends, there's something wonderful about that, even to a lost and dying world. So we are to love other Christians. Secondly, we are to love our neighbor. Matthew 22 37 and 39, you'll remember the great command well. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as your self. So not only are we to pray for all of the saints, in fact, Ephesians 6, 18, we're going to dive into to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. We pray continually, not only for the saints, but also for the lost, for our neighbors, for our friends, 
for our family members. We continually love them, and I believe the greatest expression of love is first and primarily to pray for one another. It doesn't stop there. We're, to, we're, we're called to serve one another, and to meet physical needs, to do all of those things outwardly, but if we do all of those things and we neglect the discipline of prayer in our lives, friends, we have, we have undersold what the gospel is in our lives. And so with that, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you have, he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as a head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, church, I want to pray this over you. And I want you to remember this week, if you... If you need one of these, we can get you one. But Lord willing, you were here this morning and, and have one. Place this somewhere where you can be reminded and daily throughout the week. Pray for yourself and your family that you would know and comprehend the riches of the salvation that you have in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you tonight humbled that by your grace and your grace alone, you take sinners and you make them saints. That you have, because of your kindness, called us into the body of Christ. Father, we thank you for the love that we do have inside of our church family, the love that is expressed constantly throughout the week as we serve and we encourage one another, as we build one another up. I'm grateful that as, as we remember Paul's words as he was writing to the Ephesians, that he, he was hearing reports that their love was compounding and growing, that he didn't cease to remember them in his prayers. And so I'm grateful to be a part of a church that has a heritage of genuinely loving one another, of coming alongside of each other and building one another up. And then, Father, we come before you tonight asking that you might make us a discerning people. That we, as verse 17 says, that we might have a spirit of wisdom, having the eyes of our hearts, excuse me, having a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Father, I pray that we would grow in a knowledge and an understanding of your word, that we would rightly divide the word of truth, that we would understand the meaning here. And Father, we know that apart from the working of your spirit in our lives, that that is a futile exercise. And so I ask that you would continue to work in our hearts and lives moment by moment, an ability to rightly understand your word. Father, not only in our minds should we be discerning, but also, as Paul writes, I pray that our hearts would be enlightened, that we would not only have a head knowledge, but that knowledge would be transferred to our hearts, that it would not just be a stoic, clinical, uh, academic knowledge, but that, Father, our understanding of who you are would mold our hearts, the very seat of our being. 
that we would become more and more like you. And Father, I pray that we would be a church who sets our hope not on the things of this earth, but on the hope to which you have called us to, as Paul writes here. That we would have our hope set on the second coming of Christ. That we would constantly keep in mind the fact that one day you will return to gather up your bride. Father, we long for that day. We long to be in your presence. That while we yet remain, would you give us strength and encouragement to remember the hope that you have called us to. That we don't live for the here and now, but for what is yet to come. And Father... I pray for the glorious inheritance that we have in being part of the body of Christ. That because we are no longer separated from you, because of the graciousness of the work of Christ on the cross, that we come here tonight knowing full well that we have an inheritance, a reward in heaven, not because of our works, but because of what you and you alone have done. As verses 19 and 20 encourage us, according to your power. So, Father, would you encourage our hearts all throughout the year that we come before you in prayer, not because we're good enough, we bow before your throne. We have access into the heavens tonight, not because we're good, but because you are merciful. It is according to your work. It is according to your power and not ours. So would you enliven our spirits that we would not grow weary in well-doing, that we would not neglect to pray continually for the saints, that we would not neglect this opportunity of the next year of praying for awakening. And so, Lord, I do in this time ask that you would revive in each one of us where you see fit, that you would revive in our hearts a desire to repent and turn to you in so many different areas, that we would be on fire to know your word and to lovingly carry the message of your entire word from Genesis to Revelation into our neighborhoods, into our city, into our state, and into our nation, around the world. Father, I pray that you would do what only you can do and soften hearts. Give us zeal to take the gospel forward. Father, I pray that it is the understanding of the inheritance that we have, the blessings we have in salvation that would prompt us to tell other people about the gospel. Father, I pray that we would be a church that is not twisted and contorted and rah rod into doing well and proclaiming the gospel, but that we would behold who you are in our lives and that that would give us a burning desire to make you known around the world. Father, would you continue to work in our hearts and lives in such a way that you and you alone would receive all of the glory. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to do Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery one more time.